ich hoffe, ich muss hier. Your, your screen, your oh, screen. I'm not sharing my screen. Damn. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and you always help me with that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. All right. Okay. Jeez. I need a persistent reminder that says, well, in meeting, share screen. Okay. All right. Um, so this is the question. Um, damn it. I didn't. I, okay, there we go. Now I should be sharing. Okay. So. This is, this is our weekly sync meeting, and now we're sharing, and we're recording. And we have this question um, from Alex here who says, can anyone help me figure out if something is possible? I want to view the attributes of a trained scikit model. For example, the coefficient attribute of the linear regression model. I'll pop open the docs here so we can see that, um, which is this. Um, can figure out a way how to train the model. I've done scikit model property using dir. Dur is always a good thing to use when you're trying to figure that stuff out. However, it doesn't seem to return a fitted model. Uh, is there any way of doing this? All right, let's just throw together a quick example here. <clears throat> Oops, wrong machine. Stupid. Hey, Sakshan. All right. All right. All right, so, all right, babe. Hey, Sakshan, how's it going? Okay, so, um, quick updates, actually. Just because things, things, there's a few things that have changed, and let's get this um, in. So, you guys saw this list of stuff that I put in here. So, this stuff changed over the weekend. Um, nothing really major. The only one of the major things that's happened is so we finished that transition. We had somebody who uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's not. He he hasn't. He hasn't showed up in our meeting yet, um, but he has been helping us via pull requests and all. Um, and so he. Uh, went through and he moved, he did the initial move from uh, set of PY to requirements.txt and then he moved, he helped us move again from requirements.txt to set up config. Um, so we've completed that set of config move and now we have the scale, the, the, when you do pack service dev create, it creates a, a package with a setup.config file. Um, and uh, so that, that, there's a whole thing, let me see, where's that issue? I think we've talked about this before, but um, just because this is sort of interesting from a packaging perspective, a lot of what we do is packaging. Um, and a lot of what anyone does with Python is, you know, you got to package your stuff. Um, so it's good to know about. There's an issue. We'll, we'll find it in a minute. But um, update a bunch of libraries, TensorFlow, Spacey. So part of auto SK Learn. Um, Spacey had an API breaking change because um, we upgraded a major version number. There were some edits there. Um, let's see. Um, oh, we got retry. So I had this patch sitting in this other branch um, to add retry to operations. And you guys know how that should I test always fails um, because of that stupid NPM audit endpoint. And uh, oh, what's up? I assume this is just my connection. You guys can hear me, right? I'm still. Yeah. Okay. So for some reason, I can't load GitHub. Um, where's? No, it works on the other computer. Great. All right. Fantastic. Um, okay. Anyways, so it's not important. There's an issue. We'll find it. Um, so as part of this, the reason why I started saying this is because you see this all this delete model transformers. Okay, so um, because we have to test all the models in the CI transformers, we had an issue with the updating of the APIs from when we upgraded TensorFlow to 2.4 um, from 2.3, there was transformers needed to get upgraded and that's more NLP stuff. Yeah, I think it's more MLP stuff, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, but 
didn't have time to do that. Um, don't have time to do that because we want to try to get the release out. And there's no tutorials depending on it. So we'll try to basically we spit it out into its own repo. Um, we will bring it back into the main core tree. Um, you know, once we once we get it updated. Um, but obviously, we can't have stuff that doesn't work in there. Um, and so we needed to update TensorFlow. So, anyways, that's been moved. Um, and you can check the commit message for where that's been moved to. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. You can see it if we do git log, um, and then you say model transformers. Oops. And you'll see that we've moved it over here. So I moved it to that org. Um, all right. Okay. So um, let's just let's dive into this one. That's a question because I think this is a good good thing that we can just cover real quick here. All right, we will just do this by doing the quick start here. So the question is, um, just to recap, the question is, how do we get the um, um, the properties out of the sidekit model? So for specifically the coefficient, um, and the answer is model scikit. Small model second second base. Uh, I can't remember what the property is. So is it CLF? It's CLF. Yeah. Yeah. Self dot CLF. Should be print model dot CLF dot co. Right. Let's see. Co. Yeah. All right. Let's find out. Is this seriously? Oh my god! Oh, okay, I was like, this is this the example on the front page. Seriously, not work, but okay, that's better that I copy pasted wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that would be bad. Many of us has no attribute. Oh, it's because the context. Um, that's yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Um. Yeah, because we're using the context pattern here, and I don't think we need to use the context pattern. Um, let's see. Yeah, so you'd have to do it. You'd have to say, um, there's a def main. So I guess this is, well, this is, we don't, we aren't exporting this stuff, so this isn't really like, all right, so my thought process here. I'm not explaining my thought process. Okay, so, um, um, all right, so we have this high level API and we have the double context entry pattern, right? And so this is a context, this, this is a model context that actually has this attribute of CLF. Um, and so we are exposing via the high level API, the ability to pass something that doesn't have a context. So it's gonna save and load the model every time we call it train predictor accuracy or whatever. Um, if you want to maintain, you know, the model state, then obviously what you would do is you would say model. You would you would actually create a model. I think with model as model. Oh, we don't really need to do that. We think with model as model context, and now we've got an open model, right? So uh, load model from disk if it exists. And so because between those calls, we're not we're, we're, we're saving the model basically between these train load high level ones. So um, and so then in here, we would be able to access the context because we, now we've loaded it to disk. So uh, it gets serialized here and it stays unloaded. And then it um, now it's loaded against my wish. MCTX. Oh, yeah, that's probably helpful to import things. Oh. Uh, what? Train was never awaited. I 
async io dot run o because we're using the no async I see. Oh, that may be a good thing to think about. Right, we should be not demoing that. All right, so there's the coefficient. Great. Um, so we can dump this back to the guy now. All right. All right, great. Um, everybody see what we did there? Does anybody have any? Why do we have that double context pattern? Because... If okay, well, it's because we want, and so this is also this. Remember how we talked about? I think we talked about that location thing earlier, right? As as a, one of the projects, um, cre making sure that we preserve that double context entry pattern everywhere. It's mainly for consistency without the with that throughout the code base. Thank you, um, and that will enable it's that will enable us to do. Um, That'll enable us, so we have this project, let me just explain that. So we have this project, because this is a, a good example of why yeah, GitHub loaded. So we have this possible, um, um, possible GSOC project um, related to um, supporting zip and, and tar arch and just archives as with, uh, with um, data flows and models. Um, so basically we have this directory property on everything right now we used to sort of auto generate you know what that directory default directory name might be um and uh, we we can change all of that to location um and then we can sort of write some abstraction around you know okay location what if location is not a directory passed what if it's a zip file now we can sort of auto extract that right and make it usable to the model and, and in this way we provide a more portable um, you know you can sort of just uh, tar or zip up your model directories and then send them between machines um, or you don't even have to do that you just put dot zip and now your model is going to be stored in a zip file right and it's easier to, to transport so um, another thing that you can do so so if you didn't okay so now we have this double context entry pattern that's asynchronous, right? Um, and so we go and we make that change to location. Now, say we want to support loading a model from, say we want to support loading a model, not only from an archive, but from an archive that's stored over the network somewhere, right? Um, in this case, so for example, like, you know, an HTTP, you know, an HTTP server, right? So now we can use the, you know, we'd use an async IO library for this, right? And we'd load the model asynchronously through the aenter method. Um, and then, you know, when it's done loading, then the rest of the code executes and you, you run the model, right? Um, and so if you don't have that double context entry pattern, you don't really have a good place to do that saving and loading, right? And so it's sort of, you know, right now it's not it's not really getting used much, but it's it's mainly for consistency so we can keep all of the, you know, as, as a code style and code pattern type of thing. Um, but the reason, and the reason for that is because like eventually you pretty much, like if if you take things to a certain point, then, then you know, like this, this feature that we're talking about here, right? This is sort of a, it was a premature optimization at the time for models. Um, and I guess not really, it's, it wasn't really an optimization so much as we know that this is a pattern that if we follow, then it will allow us to, you know, not have to refactor things in large ways later. Um, and then also, if we make everything follow that pattern, then, you know, then we, we can assume that we're kind of safe for all of our classes within the structure. Um, does that, does that, is that a good answer? Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Um, okay. So how do we get attributes out of the scikit models? Question blank, answer blank, and then we'll, um, Okay, and we will link to the um, okay. So, uh, and then let's just put it out. So this is because of the double uh, context entry pattern. Um, we the the high level functions um, save and load the model. Every time uh, one of them 
so which is train accuracy predict is called um, to uh, this so this ensures users never forget to save the model um, and then it also uh, but but if you wish if and I think we can do actually this is a good so I believe we can actually take this model that's open as a context and we can pass it directly to train. So let's find out though. I can't remember if this works or not. Okay, yeah, so we need this. We should, we should tr remember to support that. Um, so yeah, because this should have worked. I think there was something, I can't remember what it was. There was something else that, that tries to support this kind of thing but but this is so you know we we now we've taken it we've opened the context so we're gonna we're gonna keep we can use the idea here is that we'd be using you know the same high level functions only now we're we're as the user right as the caller we're like okay i know that i'm i'm gonna keep this thing open so i don't need to save it to disk every time right so i can i can sort of get better performance out of that um if if i wanted to by opening the context myself and then passing it to high level functions. I thought we'd support that, but we must not. So yeah, we'll go fix that. Um, okay, so it's because of the double context entry pattern, this ensure users never forget to save the model. Uh, we need to open an issue to track uh, passing context to the high level functions. Uh, uh, we should support the caller opening the context and then just using the context um, instead of creating one. From the parent, which is what we reference usually within the context you reference the, you know, the main object is called the parent. Um, so we need to open a new issue to track passing the context to high level functions, which support the caller opening the context and then just using context. Uh, this would allow the user to, um, you know, dictate uh, when the model is saved slash loaded uh, more explicitly. All right, cool. Um, oops. And the double context entry pattern notes, I believe, are located under contributing code base layout and notes. Oh, yeah, I guess we should probably just call this one. Too. Okay. Um, yeah, and this is kind of light on explanation, but maybe we'll link to this uh, explanation right here. So, to do um, add link to this meeting's video explanation. Uh, all right. Okay. So, all right. Great. Um, we need an issue here. If somebody could open an issue, that would be great. All right. All right. Now let's see. So, what else do we have? I think that's that on that one. So um, who, let's see. So Shaw, what did you want to talk about today? Uh, I've been writing tests for um, the data frame source. And uh, yeah, so I want to know which tutorial should I follow for doing okay. that. All right, cool. Um, anything else? Uh, no, no. Okay. Natash? So I have added the, I mean, my S2O's auto ML is, I think, now ready to merge because I have changed the, uh, I have added the setup.config file. Right? Okay, great. As you said, as you said, uh, we can merge it after merging some other issue. Right. So, okay, great. Yeah. And then did you do that for LightGBM too? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Both, both of them. 
Okay, we might be able to get those into this this uh, release then. Um, yep. I will check that out. And, um, <laughs> and for for HDF five, uh, I'm a bit confused to map the how to store the data and then how to retrieve something like that. So I wanted to discuss the mapping of storing the data and some in HDF. Yep. Okay. Uh, anything else? Nope. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Yash. Um, anything from your side? Uh, uh, just one thing. Like I have seen you commenting of commenting on multiple pull requests that there's an issue with black, like the formatting and stuff. Oh yeah, so I think I know what you're gonna think. What you're gonna say? <laughs> Should we implement a pre-commit hook for that? Yeah, that's that's a good idea actually, and I think. Yeah, we can implement a pre-commit hook, and uh, yeah, yeah, pre-commit hook would be good to advise people on within the contributing documentation. All right, so I have already implemented it for my library. I'll, I'll implement okay, it. Okay, great. It. Um, just for the black, just for black, yeah, or just... do we need pre-commit hooks for something else? Like, I do mean, you I have think just checks for... for white, white spaces, etc. Yeah, and that and one's broken right now. Um, but yeah, white space would be a good one. Um, yeah, if we can add this to the pre-commit hooks, that, that would be good. Um, all right, I'll do that. So, all right, great. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So, and, and that white space one, the, the correct command to run, I think is in an open issue. Um, I think we have the open issue to track changing it. Um, and the main reason why I, I think we should hold off on that. And I think I noted is because Sudhanshu's work is a massive, you know, bunch of massive changes and, and having a bunch of having, having him deal with those white space changes as well would be, you know, annoying because uh, that's going to create a lot of merge, merge confluence here and there. Um, so we'll probably wait on, on doing the white space. We, we're going to wait on, um, wait on fixing those white space changes and fix fixing the white space checker until the accuracy stuff is merged because that way we don't we don't create all those conflicts which is just going to be <laughs> annoying on top of this already really complicated um, all right. change so um so you were going to guess this you, you uh, i was going to i was going to yeah i mean no i wasn't going to say pre commit but so it was it was pretty same same line of stuff. So I've seen so in, internally we've got this project, um, and one of the things this project does is is there's YAML files and then there's UIDs, and so each each YAML document has a UID associ a UUID associated with it, um, and UUIDs are basically like random uniquely identifiable. Um, to, uh, they're identifiers, um, and so. Um, Basically, what you'll do is you'll write the YAML files, and then you submit a pull request, and then the uh, they have a GitHub action bot that goes through and edits. It it has like you know how you can enable the edits from maintainers button. So as long yeah, as you need yeah. leave that enabled, that checked, the bot can go through and then add UIDs to your to your um, PR. So what I was thinking is we, what we could do is we could have a bot that goes through and if your black check fails, we rebase through, we run black on every commit and then we force push. Um, so we could do that. That way we wouldn't have to deal with people, you know, then, then they wouldn't have to figure out the commit hook. They, they would just, you know, just work. Um, that's obviously slightly more complicated. So, so and I don't know what I kind of permissions are going to be involved in that. There are pre-implemented GitHub actions for that too. Yeah, that would be sweet if we can. Yeah, if that if that exists. So I can I can do any of them if like if you'll prefer the action I can do that. But I I, I mean I, I don't know if we have the right permissions on that. So because I've been seeing okay. basically there's there's um yeah I I've I've tried to automate multiple things with GitHub actions, but the GitHub API restricts like okay for example i was trying to automate the download of the logs for the pending dependencies things over the weekend and the yeah the actions the actions api endpoints don't let you request the log files for download unless you have admin a token with admin rights on the repo which is ridiculous because it's like what i can just go and click and download the logs now i have to like 
<laughs> now now I need admin rights all of a sudden to download the logs. And so I think there's weird things with some of the APIs where like things that you could do usually um, like with your regular user permissions, not via the API, you can't do via the API for whatever reason. Yeah. And I'm thinking that this might be one of those situations. So a pre-commit hook might be better here, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so if you're going to do one, you know, probably do the pre-commit hook and we can sort of just keep this on the back burner as a maybe thing, or if it's, you know, easy enough, because the thing is you'll go and you'll try to do it and then it'll either work or it won't. And I think it might not. So I think it's, it's more of a more of a pipe dream here. Um, and sort of to say as something to use on other projects, if you guys just to, to tell you about this technique. So if you have other projects, you can use it. I think we can't probably use this technique here because of the specific org permissions, um, that we're dealing with. So anyways, yeah, yeah just sort of a method I wanted to mention. All right. Um, anything else from your side, Yash? No, that one. Okay, so, and then let's see, and then Saksham. So Saksham, how is it going with you? It's go I was working on the config loader stuff, mm -hmm. and I just want to talk about Which a little means, about that. What do you mean? Oh, the stuff with the dirconf. Uh, oh, dirconf yeah. Files. Okay, and I think I also wanted to say that, speaking about config loader stuff, um, I really want to see us get the. I really want to see us get the config file support in the next release. Where did it go? I think I already tagged a few things. Okay. Yeah, because and you guys know you guys know this one. Um, so just yeah, just to recap, basically, you know, we have the config loaders. So we can use it. Basically, we were thinking about a similar to curl syntax, where you'd say like you know at model.yaml and then you, you know how we'd have like these we have these long list of dash model whatever right so you could take all that stuff you could put it in like a yaml file or a json file and then you know instead of copy pasting all these command line arguments say you go from a you know list command of a source to now a train command you just say at source dot yaml right within the train and the list commands and now you, you know you've essentially like you know you're your alias in and then copy paste well, effectively copy pasting in all of those dash long command line flags to each command. So you could just have a series of YAML files um, or JSON files or whatever, um, and and we'd pick those up using the config loader and sort of make them command line arguments. Um, I think I was I was doing stuff the other day and I was like, this is, would just be really helpful. And then I realized, okay, I can copy paste. It's not that big of a deal, but still. Um, it's nice because then obviously they're tracked in Git and everything. Okay. Um, all right. Let's 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 hit the, hit the ground running then. So this data frame source update method. Do you want to show us what's going on there? Uh, yeah. I'll present my screen. Just give me a moment. Uh, yeah. So. All right, we can see. Right. So the main issue I have is like the tutorial that I'm following. Uh, this one. No wait. Yeah. This one. This one uses most of the like both the examples for adding a source, they normally use a file, um, a test file to store uh, the sample data in and sort of implement it as the source. Uh, the thing with Pandas data frame is, uh, I'm not sure if we should create a file and, um, you know, store the data in that and then sort of import it for the tests. So is there any way that we could like just directly go through that without creating a file? Yeah, that's a good, so that's a good point. Um, let's see. So let's take a, take a look at that, that, that test that we were just what looking at in the right docs. Um, 
Can we look at the docs real we quick? Normally have something like this, right? Can we look at the documentation real quick? Can you? I'll tab. Cool. Um, okay. So test any. Okay. So this is sort of like a naive test for um, any source. We just do I a couple. Yeah. So so we do a couple. We do a couple. A uh, couple. We do save. We do load. Okay. Oh yeah. And we refactored this one. Okay. So I see. So this is not using that one because um, we have this other. Um, so yeah, okay. So we have that other one that's like this class that you can you can mix in um, to do like a, a, a poly uh, poly um, polymorphism or yeah polymorphism, and then you can have like test case plus source test, and then it runs some tests for you. So, um, but this is this is the um, in this case we don't have you know we don't have. Uh, we don't have, yeah, we, this is this is an example of writing just a test using the high-level save API load APIs. And I'm only calling that out because I think, you know, some of you have seen that other version of writing a source test. So I think you pretty much can just instantiate the source with the data frame and you're done. Yeah, uh, I actually, because I wanted to follow the convention as far as possible. So I just wanted to confirm that. So yeah. I can directly instantiate the source as the data frame. And it'll be done, right? Yeah, I think you can just do data frame source, you know, data frame equals data frame and a blank data frame, and then you're pretty much done here, I think. Right. So I don't need this entire. Yeah, um, you don't need that. Yeah. SDI stuff, right? Nope. Uh, thank you. Cool. That was, that was pretty much it. Thank you. All right, cool. All right. Great. So let's see, what do we got next? Um, we have, so Natesh, do you want to, um, do you want to show us what's going on with uh, HDF5? Yes, yes. I'm just sharing my screen. Let me share. Mm. Is it visible now, right? Yep. Yeah. So these two types of uh, data we can store in SGFS. Right. The first one is just a simple tabular, right? And second one is images. When we are going to store the a uh, list of images, right? So in case of table, uh, this group is like a directory, and feed is the f another directory, and F1, F2 are another directories, right? This contains the a uh, list. Uh, a NumPy array kind of data type uh, to to represent the feature stuff, and this is for the uh, prediction part, right? And the f1, f2. Uh, after combining these two features, we are going to uh, get the table part. So this is for the table structure, and for images, we have a another group directory, directory, and then image, which stores the image one, image two, where this image one is a whole. NumPy array, 2D or 3D maybe. It depends on the image, right? Cool. So at the at the time of retrieving the data, I was uh, uh, thinking that uh, how can we deal with the images part and then F1, F2 part? Because in, in, in the tabular form, uh, we just need to extract the F1 and F2 and then combine these two things to make a one table. But in case of images, uh, a whole image is uh, is, is, is yeah so you're you're we have effectively a different structure and we need to figure out how to combine the two yeah um, yeah or provide yes, one yes. yeah okay so hmm, this is interesting yeah we um, can use a flag hmm? mm -hmm. can't we use a flag here to specify if it's an image if it's an array or if it's an image or uh, the first part okay yeah, I get that, yeah, good idea. Uh, yeah, we 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 have to make a another parameter in a config that uh, the data type is like a tabular form or uh, or an image, right? That's okay. what you're saying, right? Yeah, that's what I'm. Getting. So okay, yeah. yeah. So so yeah. I have one concern about that is because we need to be able to load, you know, mul multiple types. Like, what if we had multiple groups, right? And we were loading across groups, right? And we had. Is this possible to have some image data in one group in a file, and then having some, um, you know, tabular data 
And then, because say we had a record that has tabulated data and image data stored in the same HDF5 file, how does that work? Mm. So right now, right now in a config, uh, the the attribute for the feature is just single string. So to extract the data from different groups, we need to make it a list so that user can uh, insert the list of a groups that. You have to retrieve the feature from these, 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 these many groups, right? Okay. In that, um, yep, we can we can retrieve the data from different different groups. Okay. To so that attribute in a list. Is there any way we can just say, hey, grab all of the data? You know, like you know, combine across all of what would be records. No matter what, you know, find all the features and com combine them all into, you know, each record. Do you, can you do auto discovery or is this? Do you have to do? Like, it, shouldn't there be some way to auto discover what all the features are? Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, uh, I have worked with this uh, file format once before, mm -hmm. and I think it's like a dictionary, right? Yeah. So, if it's, it's like a dictionary, then we don't know how many groups there are, how many subgroups there are. We can, we can find how many groups in a particular group are by just uh keys we just need to retrieve the keys and then we have uh that in a group let's say in a in a group directory we want to find that how many subgroups are there so we just need to find the keys present in a group so it automatically gives the feed and predict was there something like that and then we have to iterate uh, over the feed and feed to extract the data so and 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 with the way that people create these files typically you know, the data sets that are typically stored in them, is it safe to assume that, you know, there's going to be sort of a one-to-one -one mapping across all of the different types of features and subgroups? You know, is it safe to assume that, you know, okay, for index three in F1, there will be an image? Because obviously, you know, in this particular example, it's just an example, but there's no image three, right? Is that would it be a safe assumption to assume that there would always be an image three if we have a feature F one three? Oops. Well, I think Does I'm, my I'm question not makes sense. Or, okay. Um, so mm -hmm. say for example we have you know take the this is this is just a you were just drawing a diagram right, but yeah. if we looked at this as if it was an actual file right and we see okay image one at index zero of image and index image two at index one of image. Um, so, and then we have within F1, we have index zero, index one, index two, and index three, right? Four items. So if we, if we were to do auto discovery across features and we said, okay, you know, let's recursively go down through the groups and through the subgroups and identify all of the groups and subgroups that exist, right? We'd, we'd enumerate F1, F2, and image, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, in enumerating F1, F2, and image, then if we were to go through and we were to say, okay, let's pull, right, let's start creating records from this file. In that case, um, we would go through, we'd pull index 0, F1, index 0, F2, index 0, image, and we'd create a record out of that. And we do the same thing for index 1 across three of them. Now, for example, we look at this diagram and we go, okay, we go to pull index uh, two out of F1, F2, an image, and there's no image in, you know, there's no index two in image. Is that ever going to be a case based on, you know, mm, no. that will never, that will pretty much never happen? No, no. no. Okay, cool. All right. Um, that's, that's good then. Yeah. So let's go with the auto discovery and then maybe, maybe, yeah, I think let's go with the auto discovery and then we can always sort of you know, modify from there if we realized we need like an allow list or something. Okay, so so right now this kind of format is that is what I have decided. Mm -hmm. So I think user must have to follow this thing, right? The the group and then feet and read something like that. So yeah, yeah. So so mm -hmm. well. Also, I mean, I think I think, I mean, we need to make sure that this works with you know in the wild, quote unquote formats right so um so let's let's and it sounds like you know to, 
from what I know about this, it seems reasonable that this would be what we find, right? So let's try to let's try to go implement this, and then we'll evaluate because this is sort of the most. I think this is a case that we can slim down from if we find that this is not, um, you know, what 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 we wanted as originally thought. Um, whereas you know we'd end up building up if we if we went with you know our 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 specific grab these features list right so so if we auto discover everything we can always pare down from there um but i think this would be a good start you know a good, good place for us to start from before we go and analyze some some data sets all right cool um anything else on this one no no that's it okay thank you okay so let's auto discover all groups slash subgroups uh, so wherever there might be uh, data uh, and make each into a feature um, okay so and then the other thing is you know we're think thinking about predictions here um, and um, so the predictions thing is interesting um, especially as we move to Right now, the way we store predictions is sort of, you know, with the, the prediction and then the confidence. Um, and I think I think this might need to change. Um, we've thought about this a lot, right? Um, and and uh, I just want to bring it up again right now um, because when we have the prediction and the confidence, okay, like it's one thing when we're going into a source that exists and we're loading feature data, it's like, okay, now I need to go save those predictions back to the source. Okay, well, and how, how do I do that? Um, so the, I think the most obvious approach would be in, in this case, you know, you might create a group. It seems like, you know, might have a group with named by that same name and put the data in there. Um, in, but then it's like, okay, where do you put the confidence? Um, and the main reason for having the confidence is that you can now identify that a certain feature is, is, is a prediction and not just a feature. Um, so, um, you know, it's something that we came up with. Uh, so I don't know, this is something that I just, I wanted to bring this up again because I'd been thinking about it recently and I want to make sure that everybody also is thinking about it so we can figure out what the best solution here is, right? We need to c combine our, our brain power um, because we need a, we need a way to store. I think I, I've gone over it many times and I feel like we need to move to essentially just storing it under the name and then somehow storing the confidence separately. And I think like the structure of the record object might want to change to be um, so that we store the predicted value in features and then to understand whether it's a predicted value or not, we sort of, we query whether it has a, a confidence associated with it. Um, and that would allow us to do, uh, so let's take that COVID, cool COVID data, Oregon COVID data as an example here. Um, where'd that go? Except so John, you're not sharing your screen right ah, now. Damn, thank you. Um, so here's the, here's the COVID data example. Um, and so this is an example um, of, uh, this is an example of how we might combine multiple models together. So we implement this profit model um, and we train the profit model and we can use it for predictions. Um, and profit is like a, a forecasting thing. So, all right, so we grab the training, we grab the test data, um, we load it all in. Um, and we just, yeah, what, 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 oh yeah, because we needed to modify it and just mess with it a little bit. So group it by county. Um, Let's see, where's what I'm trying to show. So train, predict. Okay, so this is this is the awkwardness that is caused by having predictions in a separate thing. So predict the number of cases for each county. So first, first we predict the number of cases. So we're doing two things here. We create, we create, you can effectively think of it as two models, but we're creating a model to predict deaths given cases, because we figured that's a linear relationship probably. So let's just do this simple linear regression model, um, just for simplicity's sake. So we have a cases to deaths model, 
and then we have a model for um, uh, predicting the new the number of cases in a given county for like you know given the date um, and that's the profit one because profit operates on two things the date and, and the number of cases to predict so we do that per county because um, you, you you can only do it that's the only way you can do it with profit um, so you have to create a model per county and so that's why i say you can think of it as essentially two models but we really have one of these for each county so um, so we train the, the the model per the per county model to predict cases, and then we go through and we look we we make predictions, and so we make predictions and we figure out okay what is the you know what what will be the number of cases for that county you know for the state range, and now we have the situation where okay we need to get the predicted cases you know, sort of access that, you know, that prediction method, grab the value, don't grab the confidence and feed it through, you know, to the next model here to do a prediction. So this is a little bit awkward. Um, and what might be better examples, oops, Jesus. Um, okay, there it is. So here's the here's the by county thing. So this is that keep record thing, um, and otherwise we end up with um, uh, what do we do? We get I um, features predictions. Okay, actually maybe this ends up being kind of easy. Um, maybe okay, maybe this wasn't the best example. Um, but uh, where this where this comes in a little more is if you do a data flow and you get the output of, of, a, of a data flow as a prediction, and then you have to go in and you have to combine the features dictionary for that record with the predictions, and you have to then extract the key. I guess maybe it's not that big of a deal. I guess what I was trying to show here is that we could just pass you know, one object to the other, and now I'm realizing we can basically just do, um, let's see, for record record.features cases, actual cases evaluated cases so let's see uh, yeah. uh so uh, let me understand this you wanted to say that we uh, we should be able to use like two or three model uh, in a series one by one mm -hmm. and then the the what i'm thinking is yeah exactly right in a series right and uh and i think yash said this is called stacking i can never remember this stupid phrase um but you you have also heard it described as complex features, but basically the, the, the feature going into one model is the output of a previous model. Um, so you, you, this is not something that's like a, you know, a known truth. It's something that we came up with um, based on another model. So now you're having varying degrees, you know, as you propagate through. Um, yeah. Can, can't you just uh, write a data flow for it and or like automate it? Yeah. Yeah. We could totally write a data flow for it. Um, so yeah it was more this is more it's more of like a a uh an, an urban ergonomics of using the code thing like you know how do how do we make it as clean as possible um and i think mainly it's it's that that reaching into predictions and grabbing value is maybe not not as nice of a way to do this as let's see so features we could do you know record features record uh, predictions um and then this would be so if we did this this combines the two dictionaries um and let's see so cases predicted cases so if cases and features actual cases otherwise we set yeah so this says you know this says set the cases feature to the predicted cases uh, and then we grab actual cases just to do the reporting down here uh, but so this would take create a dictionary where we say okay record features and then uh, so basically you know take all the features from record combine them all with all the predicted features but you can't really do this if you have to reach in and grab value out of there um, so it might be more effective to make this dot predictions or dot uh, you know dot prediction work the same way features does and just return the value directly and then implement a new method called confidence 
um, which would give you the confidence. This is just I'm I'm I've been thinking about this a lot, and so I also want you guys to think about this um, because I think this is one of the main this is one of the one of the changes that we need to do before the beta um, because I don't know I have a feeling that. Does anybody particularly like it the way it is? <laughs> is I guess where I'm going with this. Uh, no, I think that what you right now did uh, just now, like the prediction and confidence being different. Mm -hmm. I like that more. Yeah. That value and confidence of uh, being in a dictionary thing was really confusing at first when yeah. I was starting. Yeah. Okay, great. So I think I, this is this is confirming my theory here, and which is why I bring it up, right? And I think we've talked about it before. The other thing which I think could be interesting here is having features include any predictions, which is this one is definitely you know this is this is where we get a little more um, confusing here. So basically, if a feature exists, right? If we know that like a, a truth. A ground truth exists for a feature. We return that that ground truth. So in this case, actual cases, right? If we happen to have a prediction, then we include the prediction, but only if we don't have a ground truth, right? Does that make sense? And then that way, if you were doing this chaining thing, right? You say, okay, give me the features, right? And the features includes. The predictions from the last one unless there was a ground truth in which case we use the ground truth right now this creates a bit of amb ambiguity right um which may not be good because you may you know you may think you're using the predicted value when really you're using the ground truth um or it may i don't know maybe that's that's sort of ergonomically friendly i guess what we can do first is we'll do this change and we'll go from there and decide if you know as as we as we write more examples and do more stuff we'll, we'll find, figure it out but i wanted to raise that all right okay so right, let's move on um that's a, i think an important change though so i wanted to make sure we cover it all right um and then did we have anything else so Saksham, so you're working on the durkov config loader stuff how's that going yeah, it's uh, it's almost. I think I'm almost there. But uh, just uh, I had a doubt here. Mm -hmm. I remember, we were working on parse unknown, mm -hmm. and we changed the we switched the missing config try accept block. Mm -hmm. I uh, it was giving me an error, and I switched it back, and all the tests are running fine. Okay, let's see what's going on here because I don't quite remember the block you're talking about. Can what, can you point me? Or can you show me a commit in, or in something? Base, in base dot pi, right? Okay. Um, so in the config class method. Let's add class method. The config is uh, sorry. Um, oh, oh, okay. So, this config class method, I uh, don't know. This the one, the one on the base configurable is that what the one you're talking about? Or are you talking? Let's see, let me just. Yeah, the one in the base configurable. Yeah. Yeah, this guy, right? Yes, yes. So here uh, we switched the minus one in the uh, from the accept block to the try block. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So it was giving me an error uh, because of uh, creating the net uh, the model class again from the exported config of model. Mm -hmm. So I can switched I the, it back. Can I see the configs? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. So this one, the the main thing where this one becomes a problem is when we have like nested stuff, and then so what this does is it tries to do it for the last level of nesting, right? To take off that label. Um, so if you have like source JSON and you just did source. Then it would go and it would look for source, but the thing is, it doesn't do. It can't do that for the upper level keys. I can't remember exactly. I think maybe we just need to. We probably we probably can implement it. Um, but for example, if you had like source JSON, 
or source df source json um that was that that would let you access the so if you had dash source dash df and then dash source right so the data flows source source that it's pre-processing and then you said dash json because you specified that you're using a json source and then you you it would be able to look in there use this try accept block is what lets it grab dash df dash source dash json or dash df dash source but it gets confused i think it gets confused with properties when you have things like this where there's properties of configs that we're nesting into in combination to that label thing as well as then yeah, it was throwing an error for yeah. the pytorch model loss uh, entry point class we made yeah okay let's take it let me take uh, wait, come on. okay there we go so let's take a look at the config file that we're talking about here So I had to change it to JSON because yeah. for some reason it was reading the spaces as indents and indents are forbidden in YAML files. Weird. Um, okay. So model config. Okay. So, and then what's the error and, and how are you loading this? So the error comes in uh, here. So this is none, right? These two are null. Mm -hmm. So it tries to uh, get the config of this when uh, it goes in traverse config get. Okay. So loss is a interpolate loadable object. The plugin is MSC loss. Okay. Okay. Hmm. So yeah. right here it tries to get uh, the config. It uh, treats the none as a it reads uh, the uh, as a dictionary. It tries to get the config for this. Huh. I wonder why that is. Um. Oh. It, okay. I can just run it for you. I think the error will yeah just, run it for me. It changed it back. I gotta jump off here in a second. My boss scheduled a meeting at the hour here. Okay, none type is not subscriptable. Okay, and let's look at the stack trace. So, okay, 550 is the line we're talking about, right? In base, let's check out base 550. God, this can fix yeah, th these two lines. Yeah, yeah, here we are. These, Great. This, um, <laughs> um, okay, so I, I I vaguely remember that last time you changed it, and you were also I very know, confused yeah. to why this was working and not working. I think the thing is that this ties into that stupid config file stuff we were talking about earlier, and just the fact that it we need. Well, we did a lot of work to do the unified config. We still aren't done unifying the config stuff. There's just, I think we 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 need to take a harder look at the whole config thing, um, because it's 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 still it's still disjoint in many ways. Um, okay, um, and I think this has to do with when we tried to go implement shared config. Uh, okay, so. When we tried to go implement shared config, we found that we needed to like, one of the things that was missing with that is sort of recursively instantiating objects starting at the bottom. So like, if you looked at everything within it, within it, within an object as a, um, if you looked at everything within an object, you know, a dictionary, and you went down to the very leaf nodes, right? You need, we need to go down to the leaf nodes so, okay, sorry, let me take it from the top. This is what I think should happen. And I think if we do this, we will have solved our config issues. Um, and it will basically, I think if we do this, we will have solved most of our issues with config, with shared config, this type of thing that you're finding and um, set us up to do the from config file stuff. Uh, and and so, and I think it's sort of taking, taking, this is sort of going back to the drawing board and say, what really needs to happen when we have configs, right? Instead of sort of what we've done, which is, okay, clobber things together until it works. Um, and now it doesn't work in some cases. So, um, 
So I think now we know more about how config works and, and the way it works is really we load any relevant files, right? For example, dirconf or, you know, the command line, you know, if we were to do these files on the command line to essentially replace command line arguments, you load all the relevant files that might have config options in them, create a massive dictionary, right? Now you go down and you recurse into the dictionary, into all of the leaf nodes, and you start saying, you know, is config dict, right? Does this thing have plugin and config? And if it does, try to load it, right? And then you yeah, just yeah. do that recursively all the way up, and now you have all your instantiated objects, right? And that that essentially, I mean, that that also provides a validation, right? Instead of doing these things, you know, loading on command, now you've loaded, um, you know, at the beginning, and so now we've done some validation there, which is great. So I think that is sort of the overall solution that that will get us to where we, we need to go. And then when we look yeah, at this, it's not happening right now, right? It's not happening right now. We have this totally disjoint thing that we've clobbered together together and refactored many times and things are happening in different places if you were to go through if you wanted to take a stab at this i think you're going i think if you implement that and you may just want to split this out into like a separate you you may want to split this out in into like like a like start a test file with unit tests this is how i start things basically you write a test file you import unit tests and you start writing everything in that one file and then when you're done, you move things into the appropriate files where they should live. Like if you write classes, move them now into where they should live and then maintain the tests, right? Um, it provides a pretty rapid development model. So I would advise maybe maybe doing something like that. I think, I don't know, it depends if you want to go that route, I guess. Let's see. Part. I mean, this is all, we're a bit down a rabbit hole because we were all... We were supposed to be I mean, doing. I could, I could take a stab at it, but I'll need your help. Yeah, I'm yeah. Sure. Let's, 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 let's take a stab. Let's. I think if you're willing, then this is something that really needs to happen. Um, so, and you've got the most experience out of the config stuff than anybody. So, um, I think this you you would be the you know a good person to 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 go do this. So, um, and obviously, you know, we'll work close together. So, all right. Okay. So let's, let's just make that the plan. I know this kind of throws a wrench in your, um, you know, your, your image stuff. Um, yeah, it'll completely stop that. Yeah. It'll stop that work. Right. Um, is there any way that we can, let's see. So what was the, yeah, the main thing here is that we're loading the model. Okay. So the next you know, thing that's, that's the error causing thing is if I do this, then everything's working. Mm -hmm. But okay, so now I will open the uh, predict.sh. So here, this is the predict. Uh, this is the data flow run records all uh, command. Yeah. And here we are not adding the records that are being loaded from the directory to this uh, uh, as an input set to the seed. Uh huh. So if we are not adding that, then we are not we we, we won't be able to read that from the uh seed uh seed image right okay um all right sorry i i have to go now um because yeah i got a, i got a meeting scheduled last minute in this time slot but i think you and i need to meet one-on-one -on -one anyway so let's actually take this offline um okay and, okay, and okay. we can meet about this because i think this is pretty in depth um yeah 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 okay cool. no problem all right thank you guys have a good one bye bye yep thanks